Welcome everyone to uh, our session on space applications aviation. I am your moderator, Georges Kouyeh-Chazouj of Business Bridge Europe. Now, what Business Bridge Europe has sought to do with a session such as uh, space applications focusing on aviation, we will also have others focusing on maritime transportation, is that we feel it is important to get the voice of the users uh, present, heard uh, on a platform such as this. And so I'm very, very happy to be moderating uh, this session. I have an excellent panel uh, with me today. We have Mr. Walter Gutz, the Head of Cabinet uh, Commissioner Valian. We have Mr. Florian Guillermé, the Executive Director of César uh, Joint Undertaking. We have Mr. Thibault Jongen, the CEO of SAPCA. And we have Mr. Uh, Thomas Reinert, Managing Director of Airlines for Europe. Now, just very, very briefly, uh, don't forget, of course, to use the hashtag for those uh, sort of social media savvy amongst the, uh, the participants uh, to use the hashtag uh, BBEspaceConf uh, for the session and for the, for the conference as a whole. And of course, uh, don't forget to insert your questions to the panel, should you wish, through our online uh, platform. Now, I'd like to start uh, with you, Mr. Uh, Goetz. And we're going to start with, I think, a very topical and a very important and, in a way, hard-hitting subject. The aviation sector has taken a very big hit as a result of, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis. Now, in what way has space uh, supported the aviation domain uh, during this time? And in what ways can it continue to do so in the future? Now, how can the Commission leverage space, its, its assets, and the data derived therefrom uh, in supporting and boosting Europe's aviation domain. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, dear, dear gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me first say uh, apologies that Commissioner Valian cannot come herself. She is uh, due to other commitments this afternoon. I'm quite honored to represent her this afternoon and to uh, address your panel on this uh, important subject. Uh, space technology is indeed already increasing the efficiency of s and safety of our travel. During the pandemic, for instance, when we started almost one year ago in handling our uh, stuck um, trucks on the, uh, on the internal borders, we used Galileo to establish also uh, apps to uh, supervise not only the traffic jams across the borders, but also to uh, manage the traffic flows uh, effectively um, so uh, this is something which uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic was already satellite-based uh, technology. As you are all were aware, EGNOS is providing navigation services for safety-critical applications across the EU. Uh, when we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the first EGNOS aviation service in March, we'll also be celebrating what Europe's public and private space stakeholders can achieve when they work together. For aviation, as it was already said in this lovely opening video, navigation, satellite navigation and EGNOS have revolutionized the navigation landscape. Um, they have opened the realm of free routes and unlocked the full potential of regional airports network that require very limited investment. Late last year, also ICAO has set the basis for a modernized satellite-based augment augmentation system standard that will make full use of Galileo. A new version of EGNOS is already under development and will be, first, to be the first system in the world offering such capabilities by 2025. Space technology is also helping, as it was said already, to modernize our air traffic management system, in particular through the Single European Sky Initiative and the CESAR Joint Undertaking Project, uh, which is its technological pillar. Providing cross-border and pan-European services, satellites support even the most demanding air traffic management applications. They do not have the limitation of terrestrial systems and can provide services, for instance, in oceanic, or oceanic airspace or in very remote regions um, uh, over continents where there is uh, uh, less uh, technical systems in place like in Europe. The European Air Traffic Management Network is already making good use of satellite data on for meteorological conditions and to complement data from radars. The potential of even broader use is substantial by combining Earth observation data with artificial intelligence to improve air traffic management performance, for instance. The COVID-19 crisis has accentuated the need to step up development of a modern 
more flexible, interoperable and resilient air traffic management systems for European skies that also supports greener aviation. This we have also quite uh, clearly um, outlined in our strategy on sustainable smart mobility, which we adopted in December last year. These are solutions will play a major role in modernizing air traffic management. By enabling more efficient flight trajectories, they will, for example, allow modern aircraft to exploit their greener and quieter technologies. Looking future into the further into the future, the Commission is ambitious regarding space-based technologies. We plan to enhance our space power and invest 13 billion in the sector over the coming seven years. And I think uh, Commissioner Breton has made also quite some promising uh, remarks uh, today at your conference. Within the coming two years, we will renew the main implementing and funding instruments for the entire CESAR project, ensuring stronger integration of satellite applications from a technological perspective. We will also put forward a proposal for the next generation of joint undertakings under the Horizon Europe program, which includes the CESAR 3 joint undertaking for air traffic management. This will support the development and validation of satellite services, integrating them into CESAR solutions. We will also continue to provide financial support to satellite-based applications through instruments such as the Connecting Europe Facility and Horizon 2020, and also the Recover and Resilience Facility, which I'm happy to expand a bit in the discussion if you are interested. I would like to add that while developing and deploying new systems are the main objectives of any modernization program, we must also consider the need to rationalize infrastructure. New systems and technologies should not overlap or duplicate legacy ones, creating economic and technical inefficiencies, particularly at the time when cost efficiency is key. I'm looking here at particularly at colleague from the aviation, uh, Thomas. Um, currently, we also have to take into account the economic situation of aviation. So uh, we cannot merely duplicate uh, infrastructure or technologies. Uh, we need to see also the investment capacity of airlines and, um, and, and go for the best solution. Uh, our stakeholders, we will, of course, uh, discuss these aspects of air traffic management modernization with stakeholders, without whom we cannot achieve any of our ambitions, ambitious objectives. So our stakeholders are include manufacturers, service providers, users, also air, air, the whole aviation industry, whose involvement is key. We are confident that the single European Sky and CESAR constitute the right framework to bring all stakeholders together to pursue and achieve common goals. With this, George, I leave it. I know the Commissioner is looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on then to, uh, to uh, Cesar. Uh, Mr. Florian Guermet, uh, satellite-based services and, and solutions are a feature, of course, of the work done by the Cesar joint undertaking, from ground-based augmentation of satellite navigation systems to approach guidance uh, for landing procedures, satellite-based data link communications, etc. Could you outline for us a few of the highlights of the uh, space-enabled projects and services that you, Cesar JU, has, has uh, developed and uh, what is currently uh, in the pipeline? Yes, thank you and good afternoon to all. Um, I think I'd like to put this uh, answer in the context of the, I mean, what I see, uh, the two main challenges we face in the aviation domain. Um, this was uh, challenges we were facing already before the crisis, but they are certainly uh, um, even more important right now. Uh, it's in relation to the uh, sustainability of aviation uh, and in relation to the digital transformation that um, um, a program like CESAR, of course, is, at, uh, is all about. Um, if I look at the uh, uh, sustainability of aviation, we know that one of the main domains in which we can act uh, quickly, as it was said, is really in the optimization of the trajectory mm. of the aircraft, making sure that uh, the most modern fleet um, that uh, uh, progressively will have uh, into operation in Europe are operated properly, um, that we don't waste, I would say, in any uh, single drop of kerosene uh, in, the, in the operations. And basically to do that, um, one of the key element is that uh, it's a global optimization. It's an optimization of the trajectories that can only be done at a European scale, at a continental scale. Mm. Um, it doesn't make sense at a national level. Uh, it will be a really a, a local optimization versus what is required uh, in a domain like aviation. And that's why typically uh, satellite-based solutions do make sense because they make sense primarily at a, a continental level and even at a worldwide level. This is an area as well where Europe 
uh, can demonstrate leadership in implementing such procedures, such technology, and using uh, satellite-based services to optimize the trajectory and reduce the impact of aviation on the environment. The second element is related to the digital transformation. Um, that's really what a program like CESAR is about. It's about the modernization. It's about uh, bringing a higher degree of automation in the management of our, our skies. Uh, and to do that, we need to exchange information. We need the uh, communication technology. Um, we, we need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, aircraft are connected. Um, and uh, again, there, um, satellite-based services uh, can play a key role uh, because uh, they allow for deployment uh, at a, a continental level, uh, whereas the tra terrestrial information, uh, infrastructure sorry, is very cumbersome to implement and it's very costly as well. So we might uh, elaborate a bit, but mm -hmm. on those two examples, Cesar has, de has um, uh, developed uh, uh, solutions in relation to trajectory management to provide environmental benefit. Uh, which doesn't stop, by the way, to CO2 reduction. Uh, it covers as well uh, noise abatement around the uh, uh, airport, for instance, uh, where we have solutions in relation to satellite-based uh, technology. Um, and in relation to uh, communication system, we have uh, uh, performed as well a number of activities uh, in close coordination with ESA on a program like IRIS, for instance, uh, to supplement the terrestrial um, data link technology with the satellite-based technology. Um, I think what is as well relevant in this approach is that it's not just about technology. Uh, you were right to mention that the regulatory framework, mm. um, and in particular the ones that uh, uh, we are trying to push through the single sky, through the notion of digital European sky, is very important um, because at the end of the day, if we focus on technology, uh, this is not uh, uh, what really matters. What matters is the level of performance of the services, and this is where the focus of the regulator has to come in the years uh, ahead of us uh, for the benefit as well of the users, because at the end, the users should be able to uh, access different type of services to compare to as well their cost. Um, but of course, from a regulatory standpoint, we need to uh, require the relevant level of performance from a safety standpoint. And these are areas as well on which we have a close cooperation, typically with EASA and with the GSA, to uh, define what will be applicable in terms of uh, service performance levels for, uh, for the aviation. Okay, perfect. Seeing as we still have a, a, a few minutes there, uh, on the issue of COVID, and, and it's, it's an issue that, of course, uh, is going to be uh, very much uh, um, omnipresent in uh, in this session, I, I think in this uh, in, the, in this conference, how has COVID impacted uh, the activities of, of Cesar JU, and has it has it by any chance you know shown uh, any space capacities that are needed uh, in the aviation sector that don't currently exist and that uh, need to be invested in, for example. Um, uh, I mean, of course, uh, COVID had a huge impact on any kind of uh, aviation activity, so there's nothing good at all in this crisis. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> no. That's, that's exactly. pretty clear uh, for, for anyone, and we were discussing this uh, just before the session uh, with Thomas. I mean, we hope uh, to get a, a swift recovery as soon as possible. I think what this crisis has highlighted, nevertheless, is again that we need to act at European level um, uh, to find solutions. Um, and that we need to build a system that is more resilient than the one we had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we know that uh, um, technology that we uh, had in place so far is not sufficient to face challenges like the ones uh, I was mentioning. Just as an example, in 2019, the traffic increased by about 3% and the CO2 emission of the system increased by about 7%. Mm -hmm. This is not a sustainable trajectory. Uh, so to optimize the, the flows of traffic, again, uh, we need to have a better solution of exchanging information with um, the aircraft. And for that, again, we have demonstrated that satellite-based services can be useful. What I think is specific in the crisis we have today <coughs> is that we have a chance to do this green recovery, <coughs> to start again from a, a traffic situation where we can optimize uh, those trajectory, use the service-based, uh, um, uh, satellite-based sorry, services that I was mentioning, to build uh, optimized trajectories as a norm and not as an exception as they mm. used to be in the European skies. Yeah, perfect. So definitely there, there's some form of opportunity then that we can find in this, uh, in the, in this dire situation. Mr. Uh, Thibault uh, Youngen, um, CEO of SAPCA, as a, a company that straddles both the aeronautics and space sectors, for you, what space-derived applications do you find particularly important for your uh, aeronautics business and for civil aviation as a whole? Uh, and how can Europe support these applications 
and also the transferable technical skills and the know-how between two sectors in order to also, of course, support <coughs> the aeronautics and aviation uh, sector. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you allow me first, I would like to give a few words about SAPCA because I think it would be mm -hmm. important and interesting for the audience, and especially yep. in context yep. of this uh, panel discussion. So SAPCA is an uh, important uh, player in the aviation and space area. Uh, we serve with our products uh, many different markets. Actually, one could say that we serve everything that flies. <laughs> uh, and flies in the air and flies in the space, actually. Um, so we uh, deliver products for the aviation, uh, commercial aviation, but also uh, defense sector with uh, what we call aerostructures, so engineered structures, aerostructures uh, that are part of the making of the airplanes. Uh, but we also are the center of excellence for all the European launchers, so space, uh, for everything that is called uh, trajectory control systems. And I will probably explain a bit more about this in a, in a minute. Then we are also an important player in everything about uh, aircraft maintenance, especially uh, defense uh, aircraft mm -hmm. maintenance. And finally, a new area where we have uh, starting developing uh, quite some successful application is drones, but uh, mm -hmm. drones for a specific market, which is the uh, industry market. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, uh, there is a clear need for non-aerospace industrialists to have and to see drones are, as a useful tool to actually be more efficient themselves. But they have no pedigree, they have no experience, expertise in aerospace. And this is where SAPCA comes in, with providing actually fully integrated total solutions for non-aerospace industries, uh, where we can still uh, provide aerospace-grade solutions, which is important, of course, in terms of uh, safety, especially when you have missions above, uh, let's say, pretty expensive assets or uh, urban environment, etc. So these are all the areas in which we have uh, developed our skills. Um, we are actually uh, the oldest aerospace industry in Belgium, and by the way, we celebrated our 100th year anniversary on 16 December 2020. Congratulations. We wanted to do a big party, <laughs> but due to COVID, again, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> we couldn't, so we have postponed it to a uh, to-be-defined date. Very good. Uh, so we will see, and hopefully we will be able to, of course, celebrate this with the world community, and again, not only the uh, aviation community, but also the space community and uh, all the our partners. Uh, we are headquartered in uh, Brussels, which also allows me to be present here physically and to provide you some company, which I think is important yes, in those yes. times. Yeah. Okay, so now to come to your question about uh, uh, how can we leverage, how can we use uh, space developed technologies for aviation? And I think I've got a couple of interesting examples. Um, the most important one for us is obviously our uh, position and our knowledge in what is called trust vector control. Um, a rocket uh, doesn't have wings, so uh, to guide its trajectory, you need actually to change the exhaust vector, so the exhaust direction of the engine. Okay, And we do this by actually doing systems that uh, uh, modify the angle of the nozzle of the engine. It's a bit like you wanted to uh, um, uh, guide uh, uh, like a pen on the tip of your finger. So it's extremely unstable, uh, extremely difficult, uh, and we do all the engineering and all the manufacturing of the systems, but not only the uh, mechanical systems that move the um, nozzle, but also everything about electronics, power management, control loops, etc. Mm -hmm. This is something that we've developed since uh, many years, and uh, we've been present since the start of the Ariane uh, adventure, so Ariane 1, etc. Today, we are on Ariane 5 and, of course, uh, developing uh, everything for Ariane 6, but also on uh, Vega and Vega C. So we are really uh, um, developed a, a skill in this. And uh, uh, through the confidence we had from our customers, Avio and Ariane Group in particular, the support of the public sector as well, ESA also in particular as well, we have actually been able to develop innovative technologies, which are what is called electromechanical actuators. So that means actuators, so trust vector control systems that are fully electrical. Well, this is something that we've developed, again, thanks to uh, the push and uh, the help of uh, and the motivation uh, to deliver an extremely robust product for the space launcher applications. And today we are considering actually leveraging this to the uh, aviation sector. Basically, all the flight controls that could be actuated, uh, mo moved 
through this innovative electromechanical technology coming from space. These are a number of advantages, of course, because as we know, the aircraft are becoming more and more electrical. Uh, it's also a finer control. We can also do a lot of technologies like health monitoring, which are much more, let's say, prone through electrical system than hydraulic system that we had before. So there are a lot of advantages that uh, we can find. And again, this is leveraging technology that has been developed for the purpose of launchers for space, but actually reuse, leverage, cross-fertilize in other applications. Another example is uh, to be able to control all these very uh, specific and special systems. We need to have robust, very uh, dependable electronics, uh, control loops, processors, things like this that we developed for launchers because, of course, we cannot afford any glitch because if the control system doesn't work, the launcher doesn't uh, go to the right place, unfortunately. Uh, and we reuse this now for our drone applications, commercial drone application, drone application from, for industrial customers, where basically the autopilot needs to be certified. The autopilot needs to actually to fulfill a number of very important strict requirements for safety, uh, and as I explained before, for uh, expensive assets or even uh, populated areas. There we need to obey to the highest standards, and actually having developed these deterministic, at least it's called, uh, control processors for space, we can now reuse them for uh, drone applications in an affordable manner. Because the, uh, the last point I want to mention about, let's say, cross-fertilization is that, of course, even if the launcher industry has not the same rates as the aerospace manufacturing industry, unfortunately, of course, uh, it still puts a lot of pressure about innovation, cost reduction, competitiveness, yeah. which we can then reuse effectively in the larger volume uh, uh, aviation market, which is, of course, beneficial for the competitiveness of the industry and, let's say, the welfare of the European society. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I also already see uh, questions uh, coming in, so that's, uh, that's always very positive. Uh, so I'm going to move on to Mr. Uh, Thomas Reiner, Managing Director of uh, Airlines for uh, Europe. Now, your organization represents both users and manufacturers in the aviation domain. Could you tell us, from a user perspective, the role that you see space data and services having in your sector, and of course, uh, and I'll also give you the floor to see uh, how COVID has affected uh, the uh, the aviation sector. You know, resilience is now more than ever crucial, and I'll give I think all the panelists the, the opportunity if you'd like to to uh, to answer this question. Um, how does space contribute to the resilience of uh, of the aviation sector? Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting us. Uh, I think it's uh, it's quite good that the uh, the end user is also uh, around the table here, the, <laughs> the customer who at the end pays for uh, all this nice <laughs> stuff. Um, but um, uh, jokes aside, no, uh, you know, space-based technologies are indeed very important. I mean, from an airlines commercial airlines perspective, because that's uh, that's the, the companies I, uh, I represent. Um, today, basically, you could divide the applications we see as valuable in two camps. One is the, the navigation and surveillance applications, and on the other hand, the communication uh, applications, um, which are uh, both important for the aircraft operations, daily operations really, the resilience of the operations, the safety operations, but also not to forget, uh, is, uh, also contributes to the passengers', the passenger's comfort. Uh, entertainment on board, <coughs> flight entertainment is increasingly important. Also the fact that people are able to continue to communicate when they're on board. Um, time is money and connectivity uh, is very important. Um, on both, you know, on both ends, whether we're talking about communications applications or uh, navigation and, and surveillance uh, uh, technologies, standardization is for uh, users like airlines very important in the industry. Um, uh, harmonization, standardization, and at the end of the day, just to refer to DB also, cost efficiency. Um, because even if you know technologies are wonderful, they have to be standardized, and at the end of the day, airlines have to be able to afford them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of uh, Datalink, uh, which is uh, one application, major applications, which is really, is now forced onto airlines, has been forced onto airlines to, to use, mandated, while at the same time, there's a real gap on the capabilities on, uh, with regards to the, the ground-based systems. So to many CEOs, when, when uh, we talk to our CEOs about technologies, when we mention the word data link, they sort of go a little bit crazy <laughs> when they say, why did we put so much money in these wonderful technologies? 
um, the same story from the aircraft manufacturers that are selling these technologies to us. Uh, but what's the use of it today? It has much more potential if we only had the terrestrial um, uh, technologies being uh, uh, implemented um, as well. Um, space technology today for, for the airlines is, is a basic ingredient. You know, let's be honest. Uh, it's not something, you know, it, it is there, it, it works well, um, and it is very important for, uh, uh, to make the trajectories uh, much more uh, efficient. Um, uh, to make air traffic control more efficient and to make the whole ATM more efficient. At the end of the day, if flying becomes more efficient, and this is also um, a political angle here, um, we can make flying much more sustainable. Um, on uh, Not only more cost efficient, but also much more sustainable, which is for uh, airlines uh, a challenge that uh, was already there since many years, uh, but because also of the green agenda, during but also post COVID-19, airlines continue to be committed uh, to making aviation also greener. In order to do that, we need to make sure that uh, the technologies uh, work. So um, space-based technologies are important to today to ensure high levels of safety and uh, high resilience of our daily op operations. Um, there are many benefits. I just mentioned a few, but um, the fact that we are uh, independent, more independent from, from ground-based technologies. Secondly, that the levels of safety and resilience have increased uh, amazingly uh, the last decades because of these um, uh, satellite-based navigation systems and communication systems. Um, and the routings have become much more important. Now, where can we improve? Um, you know, I mentioned data link, but I could also mention satellite-based ADESB services. Um, where we actually have been forced uh, to do something, but that investment on the terrestrial front has, has actually lacked. Um, data ownership, uh, data sharing, as well as possible monopolies that we see uh, coming up um, could be an issue. Uh, need for harmonization I mentioned, uh, but also recognition that we do have different satellite systems. Uh, GPS, EGNOS was mentioned, uh, GLONASS just to mention a few. The competing demands between uh, frequency bands, 5G. Everyone is talking about 5G. We all know 5G because you know we love to use our smartphone. But there is a competition uh, in certain respects with 5G for aircraft uh, aircraft equipment. I think overall we can be very positive about space-based technologies from an airline's perspective. We are fully confident, and also uh, with uh, Florian sitting next to me, uh, working in a CSR context that. With space-based technology, we can really leapfrog uh, 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 um, literally space here, thanks to the technology. Um, for airlines, it's important in a competitive market pre-COVID-19 and hopefully also post-COVID-19, commercially a competitive market, which is good for the end user, affordable ticket prices. It's important for also the manufacturers to continue to understand that as we, we exit this crisis, and the crisis itself, as Florian mentioned, is a good opportunity not to stand still and just watch and hope w until things are over, but to continue to invest in these future-oriented uh, strategies. Um, after the crisis, airlines will continue to look for cost efficiency. Uh, and, and that's why investing in technologies, yes, but it needs to be cost efficient, it needs to be affordable, and it needs to be green, it needs to be sustainable, which is additional uh, uh, challenge that uh, has come to us. Has, uh, have space-based technologies added a lot of pluses in COVID-19? Well, I would argue on one hand, no, because traffic <coughs> has been really low in the beginning, non-existent. Remember in March, they closed the borders, zero uh, traffic went to 0%, yeah. very simple, uh, at least for some of us. But uh, we cannot say that we had huge congestion for the last uh, mm. 12 months. Yeah. Having said that, it would be a mistake to, did you, to conclude that, oh, we don't need to make any investments. Uh, other crises could come today up uh, any time. Uh, think back of the Icelandic uh, volcanic ash uh, crisis, uh, weather crises, uh, sudden uh, um, uh, blockages of traffic which are out of our control. Um, so yes, I mean, that's where space-based technologies still continue to play a role, of course, COVID-19 or not. Thank you. Mm. I'm not sure if anyone wants to say a word about the resilience uh, question. If not, then, uh, then, Mr. Goods, I'd like to, to come back to you briefly before we before we move on to the questions of uh, of our uh, audience. You mentioned, of course, the, the recovery and resilience uh, mm. package. How can this tool be used to support the the aviation sector, mm. and what synergies can we find in there, maybe between space and uh, and yeah. aviation? Thank you, George. Maybe a few words about 
financing and investment of all this, which in the end, uh, it needs to be cost efficient also, as Thomas has quite rightly said. I mean, uh, uh, when it comes from the from the uh, research and development side, of course, space is uh, very much public funded. Uh, I mean, you have uh, uh, on our side in the European Commission, the Horizon Europe program. Um, we have uh, defense funds. Um, as I said, EGNOS and uh, the joint undertaking is public money, which is in there. Um, but um, um, th first of all, I would like to say that uh, we need also to make sure that the sector is available to make investments themselves in the market economy. So we need private investments. And that means that uh, the air services have to flourish soon again. Uh, trust and confidence has to come back so that people take flights again and that the, the traffic is coming back. Because that would bring then um, liquidity back to airlines, to airports, to stakeholders, uh, to the, all the, the ground handlers and whatever, and of course also to the technological side of aviation. There's no way of escaping that, that we need a flourishing and, f and, and efficient and successful and profitable aviation sector when we want to have also uh, um, air um, um, space uh, technology in the, in the market, or in the, in the uh, applied. But when it comes to the EU, what the EU can do is sitting here for the European Commission. Um, we have some specific programs like, for instance, Horizon, which finances the research. We have the Connecting Europe facility, which finances infrastructure to some extent across all modes. Of course, also aviation, uh, if it is, uh, if it is um, linked to infrastructure and to the, to the, the self corridors. So it's not that much money in there for uh, airspace technology. Um, but we have, of course, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which you mentioned. This is this famous 750 billion euros uh, next generation EU, which is now in the, um, agreed with the MFF and in the legislation. So now we are in the process of member states setting up their investment plans, what they would like to finance with this money. And it's quite a lot, um, uh, uh, 750 billion euros in the next couple of uh, four to five years. But here we are in the hands of member states. They need to put into these uh, national plans then um, technology, uh, be it research-based, uh, that's possible. We have, we have no, no, not that much limits there. I mean, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, there are some guidelines from the European side, but space technology is clearly under digital and it's clearly under Green Deal. So there is clearly a justification to put these things into the into the Recovery and Resilience Fund, because there is the big money, if you think about 750 billion euros, whereas the Connecting Europe facility has 21, 22 billion uh, for the whole seven years on all transport modes, and mainly it goes in rail and inland waterways. Um, last word maybe uh, on the EIB, don't forget the European Investment Bank um, has a lending policy, which is very green deal um, driven now, uh, but there we have to argue and we have to make clear that um, um, technology, uh, space technology and downstream applications in aviation is green deal spending, digital and green deal spending. And last but not least, state aid. I mean, uh, some airlines are profit, uh, profiting from uh, quite a portion of state aid, which was also necessary. Yeah? Otherwise, we would have seen yeah. horrible impact on the COVID-19 in the last uh, 10 months now. But of course, I mean, if, uh, for instance, you mentioned the word fleet renewals, if we need new planes in order to make them uh, capable of handling new technology, it needs again a lot of money. Currently, airlines have uh, struggling with uh, economic survival, so buying new planes is probably not the first priority at the moment. Mm. Uh, but if they get uh, um, um, money from uh, governments, or well, we have quite, uh, the Commission has quite. Uh, uh, generously uh, authorized uh, state aid, uh, rescue state aid in the last couple of months. So that money can also be used to be reinvested back in, in, in technology. Back to you, George. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, if no one has any other comments, then we can we can move directly to the uh, Q&A uh, to the Q&A session. We have uh, a number of questions. Um, so the first one to anybody who would like to answer: How can policymakers support the investment needed? for some of these sometimes quite costly technology upgrades while the industry is in such challenging circumstances? 
Yeah. I think I just replied the top yeah. part of my side, so it's <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no, just the, 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 this one triggers a, a comment from my side, and I know we are in the aviation panel, but still, uh, uh, allow me to to make a, a comment here because I think it's going to be important for the aviation as well. Is the fact that uh, policymakers and especially Europe, but I think it's also all the participating countries uh, in ESA and other uh, initiatives. Uh, to recognize the importance of some investment that might be seen as, let's say, uh, changing the competitiveness or not being, let's say, plain field or purely liberal, but is actually critical. And it's about, you know, the sovereignty of Europe. It's about uh, the uh, enabling the development of the digital uh, race huh, and the competitiveness, but also protecting our borders. So it's about space and defense. And there, for instance, uh, something that is, of course, dear to my heart uh, of SAPCA is the fact that, uh, for instance, Europe should keep having an autonomous access to space. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we just let the uh, uneven economical uh, pressures, which are actually not fully uh, open, let's say, and, and, and pure competitiveness, uh, the, there is a lot of bias from other continents, basically Europe will lose its autonomous access to space, then not being able to put its own satellites uh, in space, and then everything we discussed in this panel before about you know, availability of connectivity, etc., is going to be either not available or available at a very, very high price. When you, to, when you need to ask to, to, to China or ask uh, Russia or ask uh, the US to actually provide the launcher service. So actually launcher is a strategic public infrastructure that should be invested heavily. And also, and the example I gave before as an industrialist, also with a lot of good, uh, uh, let's say, good uh, additional opportunities for reusing the technologies that are, that are developed to keep our autonomous access to space in other fields like you know, uh, aviation, drones, and other uh, technologies. So, so it's really, really important to keep at European level to have such uh, uh, ambitious plans and, and really also defending autonomy uh, sovereignty, uh, because otherwise, again, we won't be able to uh, well uh, fare for with our own destiny and protect uh, our citizens. So, so, so I think it's a very important uh, point, and, and somehow uh, trying to answer part of the question about you know yeah. investment indeed, of, indeed, uh, of technologies. Indeed, indeed. Would anyone else, please? Yes, I, I think uh, the question is what can governments do? I think uh, I need to think of the, the partnership we really need uh, from a commercial yeah. aviation perspective uh, with governments, whether it's EU or national governments, uh, inter international institutions. Um, uh, you may know that uh, uh, only recently, less than two months ago, European Aviation, uh, through its Aviation Roundtable report, committed to uh, net zero emissions, CO2 emissions by 2050. Uh, which makes it perfectly in line with uh, the so-called Paris Agreement. Um, and that's a challenge. I mean, it's not going to come for free. Uh, there are different ways to get there. There's a whole toolbox uh, which we are currently working on and soon we'll be announcing results of that as well. But it's really airports, airlines, and navigation service providers and manufacturers that have actually agreed, look, we need, to, we need to tackle that challenge and we commit to it. And obviously, there will be a role for government, um, not only private money, uh, not only technology investment through private money or public funding, but um, we need to have also the regulatory framework. Um, so we need a true partnership. Uh, and I think uh, the European Commission fully realizes that if you say A, as, a, um, as an ask towards industry or society, you, you need to say B, you need to, you need to actually admit what you can do as a governmental uh, organization to, to create a regulatory framework. SES2 Plus, I think, for instance, is a good example. It also contributes or can contribute more to uh, reducing CO2 emissions. But uh, in order to reduce CO2 emissions, it's quite clear that fleet renewal, the introduction also of new technologies, sustainable aviation fuel, so it's all new developments, that will be the most important tools for us to get to net zero of 2050. Make mm. no mistake about it. I mean, there is no special trick. Mm. Uh, so investment in technology, and, and I think here also the space-based technologies can play an important role. So we are looking to government more than ever uh, on the sustainability banner and to reduce CO2 emissions and other emissions uh, to government more than ever to, to work with us, not only for the funding part, but probably more importantly to make sure that we are honest about a very clear regulatory framework that at least industry, when we make the investments, that we can get there and that we don't have any surprises uh, in order to get there. Of course. 
Maybe just to pick on the, on the partnership notion, because uh, I, I think it's important to stress that there is a, a public effort that obviously is being made, and in particular from the European mm -hmm. side. Um, but the industry uh, has to match and to, to come into the game as well. And this is uh, the very essence of a public-private partnership mm -hmm. uh, like César, where, for instance, we're about to launch a project to uh, test, test satellite-based uh, communication system. And for each euro that the uh, European Union is bringing through uh, Horizon 2020, typically, uh, there it is matched by one euro coming from the industry that mm. is taking as well its own risk in terms of research development. Uh, of course, it's a risk which is uh, interested because they, they hope at the end to be able to uh, commercialize product and services on that basis. But it, it's very important that we are able as well to, to leverage um, the uh, uh, private sector in investing in those technologies. Perfect. Um, excellent. So we'll move on then to the to the next question. Uh, well, again, I think to the whole panel. Uh, so how do you see the addition of a, a European ADSB by satellite service, for example, as, as a complementary mission on the future secure telecommunication constellation mentioned by Commissioner Breton, to continue to optimize uh, aviation traffic and uh, safety? Will anyone like to? Well, for you, no. Right. For you. <laughs> uh, so no, not all at once. So ADSB, <laughs> for those of you, of you who are not familiar with it, it it's, it's really uh, basically the aircraft broadcast, broadcasting information on, about its position, about its intention. And this information is either captured by uh, terrestrial antennas, and this is the system we have today in Europe, uh, or by uh, satellites uh, which are uh, um, uh, basically deployed in, in space to capture those signals. Um, and uh, uh, basically for about uh, three years now, uh, there is a, a satellite constellation that is uh, uh, being operated worldwide. It's uh, piggybacking on a, a communication system which is uh, well known. <laughs> Uh, to collect this information. And it has deployed basically a worldwide service uh, on surveillance uh, of uh, aviation that is now uh, provided on different continents, yeah. uh, including um, uh, in within the, the European one. Um, it's very important um, in terms of how we are going to be uh, ensuring the sovereignty of our skies in the future. This constellation is not a European one. Um, which means that uh, even if we can benefit from those services, we don't fully control um, uh, what is uh, uh, being communicated in there. Um, this is, for instance, how today we can acquire information uh, about the, the traffic recovery in China, um, in other regions of the world. And, and more generally speaking, I think it's essential that Europe position itself uh, on this type of uh, application and on this type of, uh, of services. Uh, because having a, a kind of monopoly, uh, which is a worldwide monopoly, um, and uh, uh, being a subject, I would say, to uh, its pricing, but as well to uh, other political influence uh, in relation to sovereignty or whatever, um, is, uh, I think, something uh, that Europe needs to tackle. So I believe we need to continue to invest uh, in such solutions. Um, I, it's very important as well to understand that what will control our skies in the future will not be what uh, controls them so far. It will all be about information. When you are talking about drones, I mean, we don't control drones as we control aircraft. It's really about communication. Um, it's really about exchanging information, exchanging trajectory. And therefore, we need as well in Europe to have our solutions for such uh, uh, services. Perfect. Anyone else want to please? Oh, just a comment. One could compare actually to, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when the, the, the cars were starting, huh? somehow before people had bicycles, pedestrians, horses, and then suddenly came cars, and then, you know, a lot of things came, you know, regulations, insurance, of course, but also all the infrastructure. Uh, and again, now we are happy because in uh, Europe we benefit from a very dense highway system, especially in Belgium, which actually has cost a lot. It was actually public investment, but it provides the key infrastructure. So really something that underlies something else. And here again, uh, all those things about, you know, an alternative for the ADSB is also key. Key to have the infrastructure so that we can develop our economy in a full sovereign manner and a full autonomous manner and uh, competitive as well. So. Perfect. Um, in that case, we will then move on to the next question. I'm glad to see so many questions. Uh, so many questions coming in. Uh, now, the next one. Well, now, with regards to uh, the integration of space and aviation and uh, the interplay between both, is the aim to stop using ground-based systems altogether? <laughs> we in a wonderful world. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Who would like to? Uh, well, it's more a technology yeah, question, but I mean, for, for us, it's more a, a commercial and cost efficiency, as I said again. So if we do invest, 
I mean, maybe it's easier said than done. Uh, I think as airlines, we, we want a lot of things. We want it needs to be cost efficient. It needs to work. It needs standard. We want to have choice at the same time. So I know uh, I have a bit of a manufacturing. I used to work for a manufacturer, so I know what the challenge is. Um, uh, and then there's a the financing bit uh, on, on top of that. Uh, but no, I mean, for, for, for commercial airlines, as I said, um, because the, the market is so highly competitive and, and our focus is, should be through technology or not, but is really the passenger or the cargo. That's the product, that's the customer. Uh, technology for us helps us, uh, but it's not, it's not going to resolve everything, sure. uh, even if we get out of crisis. And technology is an enabler, yeah. nothing more, nothing less. Um, you know, let's be blunt. Um, but from a technology perspective, whether it's possible in the future, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I think Florian knows, knows better. For us, the simpler, the easier, and the cost, more cost efficient, the better. <laughs> no, but I, I really believe we have to keep this in mind because, um, I mean, it has always been conceived as a, a complementary technology. So uh, mm. uh, not as a replacement, but as something that can uh, improve the level of service, the level of resilience, and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem is that um, it's good to say that, but at the end of the day, uh, we have never decommissioned anything uh, about the terrestrial technology. So it's complementary, but it comes on top, in particular, in yeah. terms of cost. Uh, and if I refer to the 2019 figures, the cost of the terrestrial infrastructure for aviation was close to 1 billion euro every year, mm. every year. Mm. Mm. Uh, so you can't ask to put on top of that uh, satellite-based technology and to ask uh, the airspace users, uh, the airlines, to pay uh, on top of this 1 billion euro an additional uh, uh, whatever it will be. So it, it's really about how we combine the two together to deliver the best solution. Uh, but it's very nice, and this is what we do in CESAR, to deliver new services which are advanced ones, which will be uh, satellite-based. But at the same time, it's very important that we work on the decommissioning of the old infrastructure which cost a fortune, mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, is being used by uh, sometimes users that don't even pay for this system. Yeah. Um, and so it's an economical equation which has to be tackled. And this is as well the purpose of uh, the single European Sky 2 Plus to address uh, uh, this issue and to make it uh, more relevant in terms of how, how we combine the two approaches. Mm -hmm. okay, perfect. Does anyone else like to... Uh, nothing. No, nothing to add. <laughs> Excellent. Right. So the, uh, the next question then uh, is directed, I think, directly at Airlines for uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, is Airlines for Europe working with the EU and César and aircraft manufacturers to define the priority technological investments as well as the associated appropriate incentives for airlines to invest? To me, that's, that's, uh, that's a general question. That's also a no-brainer. The answer is yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's a constant movement. Uh, it's a dynamic, and Floriano knows it. We sit together very often. Uh, we have our individual members um, uh, playing a very important role, and um, which is good because, again, as a if you make as you develop things, you need to look at the end user who needs to implement, deploy it, test it, uh, which is an important part we haven't discussed there now. But that comes with any technology uh, is the deployment, of course, where um, CESAR plays an important part. So the answer is yes, um, quite clearly. Perfect. Uh, one other question has just come in, and we, we still have some time. Um, there was a mention on SATCOM technologies as a complement to terrestrial ones. Isn't there an urgency to confirm a plan for rolling out the technology before the traffic is back to previous levels? And what incentives will be put in place to support airline investment? Hmm. <laughs> and on the plan, that's clear. That's a clear yes. We, we need to have a clear plan. That's why we have developed plans as well uh, jointly, uh, uh, like the European Master Plan, with the airspace users, with the institutions, with the member states that have been engaged in as well in this discussion. Um, I think there are as well incentives that are being put in place, in particular by Europe, to, to uh, foster these inv investments through uh, instruments like the, the deployment uh, program for CESAR, which is... Uh, uh, financed through the uh, Connected uh, Europe Facility Funds. Mm -hmm. um, I believe as well that uh, it's a matter of creating the right uh, benefits for the users at the end uh, and not to end up in a situation like what Thomas was mentioning, that we, we force through regulation uh, for the airlines to equip with a certain box or a certain mm -hmm. technology and that then they cannot use it because this is the, the counterproductive example 
uh, that we have today. So we need to move it the other way around so that if they equip, they get an advantage, uh, including potentially mm -hmm. not just a financial one, but an operational one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, as an example, maybe of this, just to, to uh, make it concrete, this is something that we, we try to work on in the context of the uh, preparation of the future CESAR program to have Green Deal demonstrators so that for the, the airlines that will be uh, equipped with trajectory management that will bring on board sustainable aviation fuel, we give them through the European networks the most optimal route so that they get a direct advantage uh, and that they can see directly the benefits and monetize it as well in terms of uh, how they justify their investments. Perfect. But there's still a sense of urgency yeah, in the sense that uh, hopefully COVID is not going to last too long. And that means that uh, when we are back to normal, maybe we might forget some of the emergencies. And so that's why probably it's important to either choose the right priorities or the right incentives to make sure that, you know, we can move quickly because uh, otherwise, again, uh, a lot of investment might be wasted, actually. So. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's something that can be encouraged through the, the, the recovery and resilience. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, certainly. And I, I think in the end, the bottom line is that we are currently in a, in a dilemma, in a very difficult situation with this COVID-19, uh, reducing the business activity of aviation so much that currently it's almost impossible to envisage a normal, normal way of um, investment capability mm -hmm. in new technology. And at the same time, we have these challenges like digital and green deal uh, which which need uh, the opposite, more investment and less in the future. I think uh, in the end, the bottom line is it needs to be commercially viable, any any technology which has to come into the market. And for aviation safety, which is very important, of course, mm -hmm. and that uh, we have the highest safety standard, and then it needs to be the right, bring the right choices and the best uh, services to consumers, be it airline as a, co a customer or more the individual passenger. Mm -hmm. um, if we can achieve that, uh, Certainly, we should not stop our uh, engagement now because of COVID. Now, it truly comes in the public sector and government, and in my case, the European Union, to use these RRF funds or the Connecting Europe facility or also state aid uh, policies to allow um, the aviation sector to, to keep on going with, uh, um, with uh, in investing and with uh, applying these new technologies so that we don't find out in a couple of years mm -hmm. that we not only had four or five years of loss of income, uh, but also of, uh, a loss of uh, development in the aviation sector. Mm -hmm. It would be a double disaster then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just please, please. I just can make uh, one more comment. Uh, thank you, Walter, for, for those uh, wise words. And I think, uh, I mean, um, uh, you know, we need to uh, also pay respect to the European Commission here uh, for uh, getting this uh, CES 2 plus proposal on the table mm -hmm. uh, last summer. Uh, it's a project we've been waiting for a proposal for, for many years uh, for a number of, I would say, probably mainly political reasons, but it's on the table now. And, um, you know, we hope that the Portuguese presidency makes sufficient progress. Uh, time for chatting is over. Um, all the preparatory work, in my view, and also, also Florian and, and other people in the Commission know, has been done. Um, and we should not use the current crisis again as an excuse not to take mm. action. Certainly, I would say, on the regulatory front, but it's because it does take time before these new pieces of legislation are actually in place. So lucky enough, in a way, we have some time, but it doesn't mean we need to stop now. We need to continue and make sure that as we enter out of this crisis and there are other regulations on the table, but CES2 Plus is particularly important because we like it so much also because it has a really forward-looking uh, approach uh, it, this is about future, not current, but also future technologies, the master plan, I mean, and, and uh, the new airspace architecture. Uh, all the work has been done, so let's get on with it now, I would say, a message, not necessarily to the European Commission, but to the other people it's in the European States. institutions. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, no, but it, it's, it's important, we have a crisis, but there are a number of pending dossiers, and CES2 Plus is one of them, yeah. so let's, let's make sure we make progress, uh, that we can, uh, we can actually get to work uh, once it's implemented. So. Perfect. Well, uh, I think that is a great place to conclude our session. I know that there are more questions to the people who have, out, who have asked the questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of, uh, of uh, time, I'm afraid. What I would encourage, uh, again, for the uh, social media savvy amongst you, is to take to, qu to Twitter and to, and to sort of start a discussion on this topic using the hashtag UBE space uh, conf. Uh, we will be on a short break until a quarter past uh, four. Uh, Central European time, and then we will be back with more sessions. Thank you very much.
And thank you to the panelists. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.